So why do we care about that? Well, it turns out it makes a big difference to the Arctic climate system, the Arctic atmosphere. And so now what I'm showing you is how the air temperatures have changed over time in the Arctic, which is this ice blue color, and the blue line, which is mid-latitudes, which is basically where we all live, sort of this strip of the Earth um, right through the middle of, of the northern of the United States. So going back to the late 1940s, what you see is that the, the temperature of the Arctic really started to rise right about when that ice really started to disappear. So we're seeing a rapid warming in the Arctic and some warming in mid-latitudes, but much, much smaller than we're seeing in the Arctic. And this difference in the warming is what we call Arctic amplification. So the reason that's important is because it changes the structure of the atmosphere, which in turn changes the wind patterns. So what I'm showing you now is how the temperatures have changed just in this last almost 20-year uh, period here, starting in 1995 to 2013, which is the period when the Arctic really started to warm up. So what you're seeing is starting around 40 degrees north, which is pretty close to Detroit, and averaged over the whole northern hemisphere here up to 80 degrees north, which is close to the North Pole. And these are, this is showing, showing you how the temperature has changed with height in the atmosphere. So we're going from the surface up to near oh, three quarters of the way up through the atmosphere. So these colors, as you can see here, zero is white, and anything that's green or yellow or red is all above um, average temperature. So you can see the warming starts and is largest at the surface where the sea ice has been lost, but the warming extends all the way up through the atmosphere. The reason we have this warming where the sea ice has been lost is because the ice is very white. It reflects a lot of the energy that comes down from the sun. And so if you lose that ice, a lot more of that energy from the sun goes right into the Arctic Ocean rather than getting reflected back to outer space. And it warms up the Arctic Ocean so that when we start to freeze up again in the fall, all that heat that was stored all summer long then gets re-released into the atmosphere before the sea ice can reform. And that's why we see this warming happening near the surface up where the ice used to be. Now the reason that's important is because it affects the, um, the height of pressure levels up in the atmosphere. So you can think of this warm air. We know that warm air expands, right? So as this warm air down near the surface expands, it bumps up these layers in the atmosphere above it. And that's what we're seeing here. These same colors indicate that the, the tops of these layers of the atmosphere are actually getting bumped up. Now, why would we care about that? Well, if we think about one of these layers of atmosphere extending, say, here from in Detroit all the way up to the Arctic, and let's say this layer of air is um, you know, high over our heads here. Um, think of the top of the layer about halfway up through the atmosphere. Where it's warmer here in Detroit, that layer is going to be higher or thicker because that air is warmer, warm air expands. But as you go towards the Arctic, where it's cold, that layer of air is much smaller in the vertical. So it effectively creates a hill in the atmosphere. And air sitting on top of this hill wants to flow down it, just like water wants to flow down the side of a mountain. So the air wants to go from here in Detroit, up over Detroit, right down to the Arctic, flowing down that hill. But this, so this creates a wind, starting blowing from south to north. But because the Earth is spinning, that wind gets turned to the right. And this creates what we call the jet stream. It's this fast-moving river of air high over our heads that encircles the northern hemisphere, created by this hill in the atmosphere. Okay? So now, remember back to Arctic amplification. We're warming the Arctic faster than we're warming the air here in Detroit. So that means the thickness of that layer is increasing more in the Arctic than it is here. In effect, it's making that hill less steep. That hill is what drives the winds of the jet stream. So if you make that hill less steep, you're making the force that drives those winds weaker, and you're weakening the winds of the jet stream. This is 
something that we can actually measure. And that's what I'm showing you here. So this line, this starting back in the 19, late 1970s, this black line here is showing you the speed of the west to east winds about halfway up through the atmosphere and how it's changed over this time period in the fall. And what you see is it's decreased by about 10%. Also plotted on here is what's been happening with the sea ice. And you can see that the winds start to really decrease right when the sea ice really started to decline. So something that meteorologists know is that when we have a weaker jet stream, it tends to take a wavier path as it travels around the northern hemisphere. These waves are in the north-south direction. So a kind of a handy way to remember that is that weaker westerly wind is wavier. So why do we care about these waves? Well, we'll talk about that in just a second, but what we know is that when these waves in the jet stream, which are shown by these two schematics here, when the waves are small, they tend to move quickly from west to east. And you can see that's happening in this schematic up here. But when the waves get bigger, which is what we expect to see as the jet stream gets weaker, those waves move much more slowly from west to east across the land behind there. So why do we care about that? Well, it turns out those waves have everything to do with the weather that we experience here on the surface. Here's a schematic of one of those waves in the jet stream. So here's the jet stream uh, following this orange line here, blowing from basically west to east. You can see that it separates the cold air to the north from the warm air to the south. But what we also know is those waves in the jet stream create the weather patterns that we experience down here on the surface. So when this part of the wave in the jet stream, when the winds are out of the southwest over your head, if Detroit were right here, you'd be in a very wet and stormy pattern because that part of the jet stream creates lifting motion in the atmosphere and it creates clouds and precipitation. But if you're in this part of the jet stream, which is what we have today, we have very dry and settled conditions. So depending on where you are relative to these waves in the jet stream, determines what your weather is that you're experiencing down on the surface. So that looks very neat and tidy and kind of easy to understand. But now let's look at the real jet stream. OK, so we are looking at real measurements of winds in the upper levels of the atmosphere. This was created by NASA's Science Visualization Studio. Where the colors are yellow and red are where the winds are blowing really fast. In other words, remember where that hill was really steep? But what you see is a very messy creature. This jet stream is not anything like what I just showed you in that schematic with that nice, simple um, waves. But instead, it's this very chaotic system with lots of swirls and all kinds of stuff going on all the time. So I want you to remember that. Remember how messy the real jet stream is. But as this rotates through one more time, what I want you to notice is how the sizes of these waves in the jet stream that I was talking about differ from time to time. So um, this is probably about a three week period that we're looking at here. And there are times when we see that these waves in the jet stream are relatively small, like here. And you think back to those schematics that I showed you a second ago. They move quite quickly across the continent. But then there are times when the waves get really big. And they tend to move very slowly. So remember, those waves are causing the weather. If the waves are moving more slowly, that means the weather that they're creating is hanging around longer in any given place. In other words, leading to more persistent weather conditions. Okay. kind of hypnotic. I like watching this thing. Okay. Are there any questions so far? Okay. So thinking about what we know about what's happening in the Arctic, warming so fast, thinking about how the jet stream is formed because of this difference in temperature, we put together this hypothesis that links this rapid Arctic warming to extreme weather events in mid-latitudes. 
So we start with the Arctic amplification. We know this causes that hill to get less steep. In other words, we call it a weakening of the poleward temperature gradient. So the gradient in the temperature is getting smaller. And that, we know, is leading to a weakening of the upper level winds. Okay? So these th first three links in the chain are pretty solid. And that's why they're colored solid. But the next link in the chain is a little more tenuous. And this is where we're really focusing our research on now. And this is where some of the controversy that David mentioned in the beginning is, is happening. So whether we're actually seeing the upper level flow become wavier or not, the real atmosphere, and whether those wavy patterns are becoming more frequent. And they sometimes lead to what we call blocks in the atmosphere. And I'll tell you more about those in a second. But if these two things are happening, those larger waves in the atmosphere we know move more slowly from west to east. And we know that when that happens, it leads to more extreme weather. So it's really these two parts of the hypothesis that we need to do more work on. And now I'm going to show you some new research that we've been doing lately and others as well. And we're starting to really understand some of the mechanisms that are connecting all of these things in the chain of events here. So that's what we're going to talk about now. So the second link in the chain, remember I showed you before how the Arctic was warming so fast and it's causing that, the thickness of the atmosphere in the Arctic to, to increase more than it is here in Detroit. So this is another way of looking at that. So these colors here are showing us the changes in the thickness of that layer of the atmosphere. Okay? So where they're red, it means the thicknesses are changing really fast or they've changed a lot in the last uh, 18 years, and where they're green, those changes are smaller. So once again, the Arctic is warming much faster. So what we can look at together with that is what's happening on a more regional basis with the upper level winds, okay? So remember I showed you that plot for the whole northern hemisphere and how the winds were decreasing. Well, the problem is the atmosphere is much messier than just one nice, simple um, pattern of wind because we see this variability in how the Arctic amplification and how the warming is happening up there. But what we see is that the winds are responding very in lockstep almost with these changes in the slope of that hill. So the purple colors here are showing you where those west to east winds are weaker and the red yellow colors are where it's stronger. And what you see is that where we're seeing this weakening of the hill we're also seeing areas where the winds are decreasing. And we can look at that for all the seasons and basically it, it has the same behavior. So we've come up with a very simple metric to actually measure whether the wind is becoming more oriented north-south versus west to east. Because what we want to find out is whether the atmosphere is really getting wavier or not. And another way to look at that is whether we see more of these north-south winds so we've come up with this very simple metric, and all it is is the V is the north-south part of the wind, and the U and V together are the total wind speed. So it's just a ratio of the north-south part to the total wind speed. And the way to think of this is if we have a, a wind, okay? This is shown by this arrow. So the wind is blowing from southwest to northeast. We can break it up into its north-south part and to its west-to-east part. So I just showed you that the west to east winds are decreasing in the places where the hill is getting less steep. So if we just decrease the west to east part, just through simple geometry, what we see is that the total wind vector, or this arrow representing the wind, changes its direction. It actually becomes aligned more north-south. So this metric here is to measure that change in that arrow. Okay? It's a very simple measure. So here we go back to our changes in the west to east wind. Now let's look at this metric in the, what we call the MCI. So that's what I'm showing you here. This is showing the changes in that index. Where it's red, it's more north-south or more wavy. And where it's blue, it's more west to east or less wavy. And what you see is that there's a very good correspondence between where the winds are weaker and where we see this tendency for the winds to become more north-south, which means the winds are becoming more wavy. 
So this is a direct link back to the, where the Arctic is warming faster than mid-latitudes. And this is just for the fall, but I could show you these for the other seasons too, and they look basically the same. So another way that we're trying to measure whether the atmosphere is actually getting these bigger waves is to think of, the, think of a measurement of the atmosphere like a topographic map that you might use for hiking. You've probably all done some hiking, and you know that when you look at a topographic map, it shows you where the hills are, where the red is, and where the valleys are, where the purple is. Okay? So this is a topographic map of the atmosphere. Think back to the thickness of that layer that I showed you before. So as you'd expect, see here's North America right here. Down in the tropics where it's warm, again that layer is very thick, and where it's cold in the Arctic, the layer is very thin. But what you can also see is if you follow these lines of equal altitude, if you will, like you would on a topographic map, it shows you the waves. So you can see the actual shape of the waves that are happening in the, in the atmosphere on this particular day. Okay? This happens to be when the polar vortex attacked us last winter. So we had this big dip in the jet stream. Remember how I told you the jet stream separates the cold air from the north? Where these lines are very close together, it's where the hill is very steep, it's where the winds are very strong, that's where the jet stream is. And so it dipped south of Detroit in this, on this particular day, and all that cold Arctic air descended um, in this area. 